Hi, I have Fabiana Melendez with Zilker Media here today. Hi, Fabiana. Hi, I'm so excited to be here. I always love connecting with other PR pros. Yeah, so really quick, um, Zilker Media, uh, Fabiana is a senior publicist there, Mm -hmm. but she has been doing diversity marketing for Zilker Media's clients. So we're going to talk about that. But first, tell me a little bit about Zilker Media. Um, You just had something interesting to say about (laughs) the name of the company. Yes. So Zilker Media is a boutique agency based in Austin. We all love Austin, right? (laughs) So um, Zilker is a big park in the city. It's kind of like our central park. Um, If you have been to Austin or have lived in Austin, you know Zilker. And so that's kind of the namesake for the agency, just to give it a little bit of a, of a vibe, like an Austin vibe. And I forget that if you're not from Austin, like you don't know what Zilker is. It's such a strange word. (laughs) Yeah. So do you guys accept clients out of Austin? Yes. So we work with clients all over the U.S. um, And I personally have done international pitching for clients that have products abroad, um, mostly in Spanish, though, because that's kind of my other strong suit. Uh, But yeah, we we've we're one of the few agencies or that I feel didn't have such a hard time transitioning to that work from home model during COVID because we were already remote. So we oh, have okay. a model, it's really interesting. And I think it's one of the best perks is we're in office two days a week and we work from home three days a week. Um, so really adapting to a full-time work from home model wasn't that big of a difference. It was just add two more days where you're waking up, rolling out right at 8.30 and then turning on the computer at nine. Well, that's cool. I kind of want to talk about that at some point. That's yes. just an interesting <laughs> concept. But um, so what is diversity marketing? Yes, that's a great question. So diversity marketing It's kind of what it sounds like, but it's essentially taking aspects um, or considering, not necessarily taking, but considering aspects of different cultures and subgroups and incorporating those into your marketing strategy. Um, So it goes beyond just having copy in Spanish or having copy in another language. It's actively trying to expand um, the reach uh, and the way you you tackle the marketing for your brand, your product, your service, or your clients if you're on the agency side of it. Okay. And so this isn't a new concept, right? I mean, it's just that everybody's talking about it now, but you guys have been doing this for a while. Yeah. So it kind of happened. I don't want to say when I came on, it just kind of is my personal like approach to communication is we need to think about what's going on in the world and what your service is and what your product is and like why having certain conversations are important. And it just so happened that it blew up around uh, the time all the protests started this year. And we know this year has been very hectic. Um, So we had all the protests around Black Lives Matter and things like that. And so it was, I realized, or we kind of realized a lot of companies aren't necessarily equipped to handle those sorts of conversations. And it's one thing to handle it internally through like HR and DE&I consultants who come in and talk about it. But it's another thing to have this like internal reckoning and then say, okay, how do we take these um, diversity, equity, and inclusion um, assets and initiatives and incorporate them externally So people know that this is who we are and and this is our mission and these are our values and we support diversity marketing. So that was really, it was really like in May or June where it kind of blew up and clients were like, what do we do? What do we say? Do we say anything? How do we approach it? Um, And so it, it was a very interesting shift because it's always been there. And I think more so in the last couple of years, um, agencies and brands and, and, businesses have been wanting to diversify their marketing efforts, but it kind of reached a zenith now. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. So I have, now I have three questions for you. Yeah, all go for it. Um, and because I'm seeing three different parts to this, um, mm-hmm. 
So I guess I'll, I'll kind of back up to the beginning when you're talking about just dive, cause you're talking about diversity marketing, and then you're also talking about bringing in DEI to marketing. Yeah. So for me, I just want to talk about both aspects because from, I sort of see them differently and that might be incorrect, but I think the diver, possibly the diversity marketing is like kind of what you're saying. You need to do more. You've got to get in with the group that you're trying to market mm -hmm. to, like get into the mindset. Um, and so is that the case? And if so, does it help to be a member of that community? That's a great question. So I think that diversity and, and really any initiative that you do that tackles a sort of difficult subject externally needs to start internally. So if you want to tackle diversity marketing um, and you want to be a part of these really difficult conversations, I, I do believe that it's important as communicators, right, as publicists and, and marketers to also have those conversations internally and see, well, what are we doing? Um, because why would people listen to us if we're not exemplifying what we're marketing, right? So um, I think, yes, you can market to different groups and not necessarily be a part of the subgroup or the culture, but I also think it needs to be done in a way that's respectful and careful and maybe bring in consultants or talk to people that are in those subgroups to make sure that it's being done correctly. And at the same time, while you're having these external discussions, having the internal discussions to make sure that it's all aligned. Okay. And then when you say we as a collective, we meaning PR people or communicators, that's who we are. That's who our audience is. Yeah. But you're also saying the collective we in terms of like internal. So yeah. at a company, we need yeah. to have that conversation like we, if we were at the company. So it's like yeah. you, uh, you know, or if, if you were the client, you need to have that right. internal conversation first. And then I and then ideally do yeah. some DEI work. Is that kind of what yep. you're saying? Yeah. And it's it, sometimes when publicists hear this, it can be really daunting because it's like, well, I'm kind of taking this role as like, uh, as like a mediator for these difficult conversations, but I'm a big believer that we are the communicators of the world, right? That is what you do when you're a marketer, you communicate. And so ha being able to facilitate those conversations with clients and help them understand why diversity marketing and these really heavy topics or things that we need to discuss um, is important, right? Like, again, why would you bring it externally if you can't do it internally? Um, like, especially in an agency setting, right? Like, if we're not exemplifying the things we're counseling clients on, why would they listen to us? Mm hmm. So then, well, right. But so your, your advice is to have them work on their DEI first internally, yeah. and then you'll externally market it. But right. so um, do you accept clients that want the outward diversity marketing if they have no evidence of doing any internal DEI first? Yes. And the reason is, um, sometimes you have to take the baby steps to get there. Sometimes it's having the conversation about why doing it externally matters and then saying, okay, look at the results, look at the ROI from the work externally. Let's have a little chat about internally. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, sometimes having that chat is the first step. Right? right. It's the first step to DEI. So I've kind of, not that I'm a DEI firm, but I've mentioned yeah. this before. I've talked to clients about this a couple of years ago. Right. Mm -hmm. And so now they're finally working on it and it's not disingenuous. It's just yeah. that what, what's happening right now is a call to action right. and the companies, they know they've needed to do it, but sometimes we just need a kick in the pants to just act. Yeah. And there have been times, not at current, I'm a current agency, but in previous positions where clients were hesitant to do it, and it can get a little tricky and scary because you, you don't want to assume the worst. You don't want to assume that they, you know, are X, Y, or Z. And so I learned that a lot of the times the hesitancy is because they just don't know. They just don't know how to do it or how to implement it. And also, 
they want to please everybody and they want to make sure that it doesn't appear to be disingenuous, even if it isn't. But, you know, people can be very quick if you're on the receiving end of the, of the advertisements or the social communications to be like, well, that was, that was a little quick. That was a little swift. I don't know if it was genuine of that brand to, you know, put this black model on, on the cover of this or that. Um, and so really it's just about kind of coaching them through like, this is why it's beneficial, not just for your product or your service, but also for you as a company and helping them understand like the how, like what are the baby steps that we can take? Cause it's not, diversity isn't a one size fits all. I think that's the other thing, right? Diversity is such a buzzword. It's like the word du jour right now. Um, and so it's really easy to say, well, let's just patch this up really quickly, put a bandaid on it, put a couple of models of color, a couple of Spanish copies out and then like kind of be done. Um, but it's something that's long game, right? That takes time. Um, and so having that conversation and sort of helping them see why it's beneficial long term can really help uh, facilitate it for the long run. Yeah, I would think so. And then DEI is, well, so evolution is, is forever. So we yeah. can always evolve. We can always improve. We should always be challenging ourselves, whether you're yeah. running a business or trying to grow, you know, emotionally. And then I think, well, I've heard that DEI fits into that. And so we can always do better and always look at our blind spots. Well, and it's, yeah. And I see it from both. Like I get the like financial reasons for it. Cause some clients are like, I get, I get it'll make me more money, which is a very interesting perspective to go from it that way. And it's like, yeah, I, I get that. But also, you know, at the end of the day, marketing as a whole, you know, PR and advertising and social, it's about selling a fantasy. You're communicating, you're representing a brand, but you're also selling a fantasy. And with the world that we have now where, you know, we kind of call America the melting pot. We have so many different cultures and subcultures and subgroups. Why would I buy into your fantasy if I don't see myself in it? And why would I buy myself? Why would I see myself in that fantasy if I don't feel like you genuinely want me in it? Mm -hmm. So how do you guys, let's say you have a client that isn't, um, you know, it part of your culture. How do you mm -hmm. like psychologically kind of get into that culture to, to figure out how to market to that culture? Yeah, that's a great question. Again, <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, a lot of it is about having research, uh, doing research on the culture and the aspects. Um, we work with a couple of clients where we do translations, and I handle that because I speak Spanish, I'm from the culture, and I can counsel. But if we didn't, um, you ask, I mean, I ask them directly. I have clients that, you know, are Black women, uh, Black executives, and predominantly white male executive spaces. And so when a lot of the protests came out, I straight up asked them, like, listen, I'm a Latin woman. I have a certain sense of what's going on, but I'm also not a black woman in your shoes. So I need you, you know, this is a partnership. As much as I counsel you, I also need some of your counsel to understand culturally what is going on so I can better represent you and better communicate this externally. Um, and I think, again, with marketers, it's really hard, right? Because we come in as the vendor or the counsel for the for a client and you're kind of expected to just know but i think we it, it, pr is shifting and being able to have those op open conversations with clients and say like i think i recommend doing this or pitching this or talking about this but i i need to know your feelings and your thoughts about it as someone in that culture is also a really great thing to do um because it, clients are still people, right? And they aren't going to expect you to know every aspect or facet of their culture. And I think there's a, a certain sense of mutualistic respect that is built when you come up and say, how do you feel about this? Well, yeah. And I do think even if you're not talking about diversity, I have found that the client represent a, a lot of times the client represents the demographic. Yeah. So even if you're talking about B2B or what have you, mm -hmm. they know best. And, um, I, as you were talking, I was just thinking maybe our role as communicators is to draw out what they don't know that they do know. Yes. It's not, you don't know what you don't know. It's you know, don't know what you do know. Yeah. <laughs> and no, my and, job yeah. is to like, be like, yes, 
like meaning cheerleader, this is actually really cool what you're saying. You don't know it's cool, but we're going to market it. <laughs> right. And that's why I always say like being a publicist is so interesting because people don't really know what you do. And so I summarize it as at the end of the day, we're storytellers and communicators, one. And two, we take concepts that are not digestible for a mainstream audience and we draw out the nuggets so people understand what you do. Like that's more or less it. So kind of going off topic, because we do have time and I do want to, I do want to get back to a few things just so our audience knows, we're going to talk about examples that you have done where you've taken DEI, so internal initiatives and marketed the, mm -hmm. or like infuse them into diversity marketing, not that you market internal initiatives. <laughs> and then talk, I also do want to talk about B2B, but first to go off topic, because okay. that's my specialty. <laughs> um, Okay. So, um, publicist is a dirty word in PR. Have you, have you ever noticed that? And I don't know why. I just want to know why you call it, why your firm uses that word and why is it a dirty word? And maybe we can dispel the myths around that. Word. I know whenever people ask what my title is and I say publicist, they're like, no, no, no. I know what you do, but like, what's your title? And I'm like, Publi <laughs> I'm like, I'm a publicist. Like, that's what it is at the end of the day. Like, um, I don't have this like extraneous title that that is like kind of wordsmith to sound like something else. And I think, you know, publicists do have a bad rep. Unfortunately, um, part of it has to do with like portrayals on TV shows. I mean, think of famous publicists. Samantha from Sex and the City, who I love, but never actually, I think, did any work. Um, and then you have Scandal. Um, and that was all like political PR, but it was still very like fictitious. And then of course you have shows like the West Wing with press secretaries, which I guess has some semblance of truth. So I feel like the way we're portrayed is more as like spin masters and we're the fixer, we fix things. Um, so no matter what a client does, good or bad, we can fix it and we can spin it. And so people are like, well, why should I trust you if you're the world's, the world's best liar? Um, and so I don't think publicist is a dirty word. Um, and I think, you know, I, I, I'm very big at like just confronting it and saying it how it is and saying like, I am a publicist and um, I don't spin. And my, my personal tenant and something that Zilker also does is you always tell the truth. So in the moments where I've had clients in crisis, my number one rule is you need, do not lie. Do not lie. Don't make me spin this for you. Um, we can find a way to be honest and work through it, but don't lie. Um, and I, I, that isn't to say that publicists are liars. Don't, nobody come for me, <laughs> but you know, I feel like that's just what people think. And it's kind of the same way people feel about lawyers. Like we're kind of necessary evils that exist to, you know, sometimes do really good things and sometimes do not so good things. So it's always very interesting um, mm -hmm. we don't shy away from the word publicist because that's what we do. We do publicity. So, and then I know that all of those things that you talked about are myths. And the reason they're on TV is because it's just sexy and It's fun. exciting. It's titillating. So, but my thought of what publicist is, which maybe you can train me on this because I don't know. Um, I kind of thought it was, it's more about like, so you're pu publicizing. So you're getting stuff out there. It used to be just in traditional news, but now it's social media and what have you. Um, so you're just publicizing, but I kind of thought that the, the um, word connotated definitely like red carpet type PR. So flashy, P fa this is what I call fancy PR, <laughs> red carpet PR, and possibly consumer PR. Is that incorrect? Or Well, I mean, there's all kinds of publicists. I mean, and, and even if you don't call yourself a publicist, but you're like the head of communications or the communications manager at a B2B company or a tech company or a healthcare company, like at the end of the day, you're the person that publicizes that B2B brand or that hospital and make sure that all of the communications internal and external are handled. Um, so I feel like, yeah, publicists are definitely thought of as like the one on the red carpet or the one on the TV show that's like, my client has no comment. But, but at the end of the day, like there's so many different publicists that 
we shouldn't shy away from the word. Okay. Yeah. So, and a word is just a word, yeah. right? Like, yeah. So, um, okay. So let's go, well, since we're talking about consumer versus, mm-hmm. well, not versus B2B, but so how do you, what if you want to do diversity marketing, but you mostly represent B2B brands, so you don't need even a model or anything like that? Yeah. So I worked in B2B and tech for a little bit and I handled PR there and people, I feel like this is very controversial, but B2B is really not that much different from consumer brands. Like you still have social media, you have Twitter, you have Instagram, you have newsletters, you have email leads that you email. Um, and, and I think there's always this divide of like the B2B marketers and the consumer marketers and one is this and one is that. And at the end of the day, it's, it's the same thing. B2B brands want to represent the companies that they service um, just as well as consumer brands want to represent the customers that buy their products, right? So something that I recommend for diversity marketing there is don't fall stagnant. And I also think there's a little bit of a fear um, when it comes to B2B because it's like, well, if we're, if most of our client base are company, these companies with DCOs and this sort of model, you know, I'm a little hesitant to branch out, but it's like, you know, just because most of your, the companies you serve are Silicon Valley based with Ivy League, you know, CEOs doesn't mean that you don't have more target audiences that want to buy from you. And also the companies whose services um, who you provide services to or products to if you're in the B2B space probably also have DE&I initiatives. So their employees want to see themselves represented in what you're giving the company that they're using, right? If, mm-hmm. if they get the newsletter or the collateral or whatever and you sell, I don't know, like a, like a Zoom type VOIP video conferencing service and all of the models um, on the screens look a certain way and they don't see themselves represented it'd be kind of like well you know the service is great but i i I don't feel like i'm i'm being really listened to um and yeah i mean i think again people think it's very different from consumer brands and i really don't see it that way yeah and a part of marketing or a goal for marketing is um employee engagement and culture like internal culture so Mm -hmm. Um, because who they might be your biggest and best audience is your internal culture. Right. And so you might want to ha- make sure that they are represented. Um, right. And so do you have, so I really liked what you said about how like those Silicon Valley type companies, they should be, and they probably are doing DEI initiatives. So how do we segue into the next question, which was, how do you take your internal DEI initiatives and then infuse them into your marketing? Yes. Yeah, so again, um, internal DEI initiatives feed into the external marketing. Um, the in, if the internal practices don't reflect what you're trying to achieve externally, that's when it, the message can kind of fizzle out and get a little muddled. So let's say you're doing it the other way around. Let's say you do have diversity marketing and you have a great, you know, Instagram feed and and you have very diverse models and there's plus size models and models of color, et cetera. Let's say you're like a consumer brand. Um, But then, you know, something like the protests happen and then your employees are like, hey, we do a really great job marketing externally, but we're not represented internally. that's one of those great moments again when communicators i feel are the stewards of communication within a company and you should feel empowered as a publicist and as a marketer to come up to leadership or a ceo and say like listen we do a great job externally i believe in the brand and the message and the vision and our clients love what we do but it's time to have this conversation internally and see how we can approach the diversity marketing we're doing and sort of um, reverse engineer it so we have a better DEI program within the company. Um, and then, of course, there's also the other way around where you're starting to make those strides internally, but it's not being reflected externally, which I think that one tends to be the most common scenario. 
And then what do you do in that instance? How do you start to infuse it into external if you already have it internal? And I do think some of my clients in particular are kind of not wanting to do that right now because they don't, because of this being in disingenuous, because people right. are looking at what other companies are doing and thinking, oh, I want to do the internal work because it's so important, but I'm going to just stay quiet about it for now. Yes. Yeah, so number one tip, don't be afraid. Um, do not be afraid to put out a message, be it on social media, be it um, on your website about the work that you're doing, just sort of highlighting this is what we've seen. This is the work we're doing internally. And these are the steps we're going to take externally. I think when you take the first step and show, um, you know, your conviction and your passion towards these DEI initiatives, people will see that you are trying and that it, it isn't disingenuous. Um, the second biggest tip is you're never going to please everybody, which is like the oldest sort of adage in the book, but you're really not. Like, if you really believe in diversity marketing, you really believe in its importance and its value, not just from a business standpoint, but from a human and like empathetic and communication standpoint, then yes, there are people that might comment um, on your socials and say like, very interesting that this is a s sort of sudden change, but like those people are always going to be there. Um, and if you have a well thought out strategy from a publicist such as you, <laughs> um, <laughs> then that can be mitigated and we can work through it. And Sometimes it's also really easy to forget that brands are people too. And behind that brand, there's a CEO or, or um, you know, a marketing person that might actually get a little hurt about it. And so it's understanding like you're a human being and it's okay to have these fears. But if you never take that first step, it's just going to prolong the issue. Um, and by the time you do decide, okay, we need more diversity marketing, well, at this point, it might be too late for your brand. And it's, it's easier to, again, take the first step and, and take the baby steps to get there than to try and go back and, and treat um, the issue once it's too full-blown. Okay. So what if you have a client? Now you're just giving me personal advice, so I should like you know, pay you hourly or something. Um, so, but what if you have a client who does not want to, so who doesn't want to look like the DEI work they're doing is for the recognition because their internal staff is the most important audience for them. Um, so they want, they don't want to look like, oh, we're doing this for this, like, like they're like, oh, we're actually donating to like these great charities and this and that, but we're not going to do a press release about it. Yeah. So they don't have to, and they shouldn't, but I do think that putting out a message of compassion and putting out a message or a statement, at least saying like, these are the things, and it doesn't have to get too political because it's always really hard, right? Um, because things can get politicized very quickly, but if you don't want the recognition, but you still want people to know that the brand has empathy or, or understands what's going on, putting out some sort of message that isn't necessarily a press release, but doing a sort of Instagram live um, saying, okay, we're, we're going to answer a couple questions or we're going to talk through what we've been doing internally and why this is important to us goes a really, really long way. Um, you're letting people into your space. You're letting them see, okay, um, and it's funny because it's like, I don't want the recognition, but also get on Instagram, but that's just the way it goes, right? It's like, you want people to know what you're doing and it's important and it's valuable and not just for the brand, you also, for the client also has to think beyond the longevity of their brand. Like if you really believe in the, in de and I, if you really believe in what's going on, sometimes it's worth to just let people in a little bit and see what you're doing. Um, and again, it doesn't have to be a full press release. You don't have to give numbers and we donated this much to the ACLU or we've done X, Y, or Z. Um, but maybe having a Q&A or, or a, a short video on what you've been doing internally can really help. And, and yeah, of course, the internal employees or the people internally always have to be number one. Um, but if number two, if clients don't, if customers don't know what's going on internally, then they'll never know. They don't work for the company. 
Yeah. And I do want to be clear are in the beginning when everything started to happen, all of my clients did put out state my statements yeah. that black, black lives matter because mm-hmm. they do. <laughs> like, right. I don't have any right. clients that are going to debate that. And yeah. we're like, be all like, like, that. Yeah, like, duh. But, yeah. and then there were like kind of infusing little things about our little DEI stuff, mm-hmm. but then it's like, we're still working on it, but we're not talking about it. So it's kind of like, hmm, now what? But I think what you're saying is that it's a long process. Yes. So we yeah. did do the first step yeah. and they're doing the internal work. And I think as communicators, we just kind of check in on it mm-hmm. and see what we can do. And then from checking in, yeah, that's where the ideas can come. So right. what one thing we did is we added that. So we do have monthly meetings with our clients. Mm-hmm. So we added a DEI section just to the agenda just to be like, and, and I'm a little bit worried about that because I don't feel like it's our place to be checking up on our clients Yeah, for that. Cause they didn't hire us for that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm kind of thinking about that, but currently we have that in there. It's just like a checklist so that every month we remember to talk about it. And then we are just informed of what's going on. And then from there, yeah. my team can decide, okay, are we going to push to publicize this or not? Mm-hmm. You know? And it can even be um, the thing that some other brands have been doing where they give their platform, you know, and of course it depends on the brand and and what, you know, what they're comfortable with. But if it's like, we believe in this, but we are, we don't feel equipped because a lot of the time the fear also comes from them not feeling equipped to handle it um, or to be able to have the conversations if they're, you know, if their CEO is, you know, a white woman or whatever, whatever it may be. So giving your Instagram over to a a brand in the space that's owned by a black CEO um, or a specialist in DE&I who um, is, you know, a black, a black woman or or a Latin woman, depending on what the topic is and saying, you know, this is the work we're doing. We think it's really important to amplify these voices. Um, We're giving, we're doing an Instagram live with X company, um, and we'll just let them talk about why it's really important to have these initiatives or why the work they're doing in our space is equally important and give it over that way. And so that way it's like they're, the focus is on the other person, but it's highlighting why, that, they, that your client or the company that you represent does care about these initiatives. Oh my God, I love that idea. So <laughs> that's a cool <laughs> idea. And it, and it balances it out too right because it's like great you don't want your press release you don't want me to publicize it which is fair right because it's so hard sometimes being a publicist too because it's such a balancing act of like I want to publicize all the things you do but I also don't want it to be all about you if it's important right we don't want to co-op the message so you know you take that focus on someone else who probably is it for lack of a better term more qualified to speak on the specific issue um but you still, you know, you look great and you, you, you fulfill part of your DNI initiatives. Totally. Um, so is there anything else that I didn't, um, ask you that I should have or anything? Um, just kind of, I mean, I guess, I don't know if I did ask you this, sorry, I'll let you interject if there was something. That <laughs> well, you- the biggest thing I really want to want people to also take away is we've kind of moved past suggestions and implying. I think we all kind of tiptoed around diversity the past couple of years. And that's okay because, well, it's not really okay, but it was kind of just making its way full steam ahead into the workplace. And, um, and it's something that it needs to happen. But I think maybe a few years ago, there was more room to be gentler with these discussions. And that isn't to say, you know, be rough or be mean or just face it head on with clients, right? There's a certain sense of tact, but now I think, it's no longer an option. I think now diversity marketing is a necessity. Um, And so something I've noticed talking to fellow publicists or marketers is this sort of fear to really go out and counsel clients um, or to talk about more than what's on the agenda or what's on the monthly report or the ROI or the KPIs. It is okay to counsel them and have discussions about these sorts of things and kind of talk about it head on. Um, just to see where they are and if you're on the same page um, and also how we can all get on the same page and really broach these discussions. Because I think, you know, if you don't evolve, you kind of die, right? If you don't talk about 
these discussions, it's not going to be good for your brand long term. And we don't want that, right? And a lot of the times, it's not just this person doesn't want to talk about it, because they're a racist or whatever, because that's how some people think it's more of what are their fears? Um, what are what is the hesitancy? Why? Let, let's talk. Let's have a one on one. Let's use you know, use your commu- your skills and expertise as a communicator to bring that out of them. Okay. Okay. Well, that's perfect. I think that's a <laughs> nice way to end. And it's also kind of, yeah, going a little bit above and beyond just the agenda, I guess, or the, the check marks and thinking yeah. about everything. And that's our role. We are at the end of the day, consultants, or we're, we're helping people. We're in the service industry. So and it's, yeah. And it's so easy to feel passive and that's, and I'm, I'm fairly young and I came into the game fairly young, but when I worked with publicists that had been around for 20 or 30 years, it was like, no, we don't do it this way. We don't have these discussions. We give them their press and we move on. And it's like, well, you have to see it as if you were their attorney, right? You come in and you counsel them. We are their attorneys for the media. I kind of always see it that way. We represent and we counsel them on their brand and for the press. And within that, you have to have those discussions. It's like, how can I facilitate this for you? I can't better represent you if I don't understand where your headspace is. Yes. Perfect. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I bet you guys are busy and I, I wish you luck. And um, yeah, this was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Amy. This was great.